almost able to come out of nowhere. This is the M18 Hellcat. During World War II, nothing was more nimble on the battlefield. If you saw one coming, it was already too late. I'll tell you what's so cool about the Hellcat. It's like running around in a powerboat. You can fishtail the thing, you can, you can run it around in figure eights, and it just goes faster and faster, and you're throwing a dirt, and, and you're throwing a big cloud of dust, and it's a, like a sports car, and, it, and it's a real smooth ride. You can go over dips and bumps. It's the ultimate all-terrain vehicle. The M18 Hellcat is just one of almost 200 pieces of the Carl Smith Collection in Twilly, Utah, not far from Salt Lake City. Businessman Carl Smith is the man and the money behind the operation. Carl is a big fan of tanks. He's a huge fan of war veterans. But he's not a fan of being in front of the camera. But you're welcome to walk through what he calls the sandbox. Battle-scarred tanks don't come back to life on their own. They need a dedicated crew, radical surgery, and serious attention to detail. To make this happen, Carl has pulled together an amazing team. The man in charge of the metal makeovers is Roger Condren. He's a 30-year veteran of the restoration scene. I take something that's bent, broken, uh, destroyed, clean it up, fix it up, remanufacture it, and uh, bring it back to what it was or what it would have been. Whenever he needs backup, Roger pulls in a first-class crew. Greg Lloyd worked for over 20 years in a steel plant. At the tank workshop, his nickname is Goose. Oh, yeah. A lot of places where I go, the, the folks will ask me, they say, well, what do you, what is it that you do for a living? And I say, well, I, I uh, restore World War II vehicles. And they kind of look at me like, that's a cool job. And, and boy, I'd like to have your job. Randy Killen has created special effects magic for classic films like Jaws, Blade Runner, and Titanic. Building scale models in Hollywood was the perfect training ground for rebuilding 40-ton tanks. There's all kinds of things in movies that don't really exist in real life, so you have to come up with some kind of creative solution to something that doesn't really exist. Another key part of the tank crew is writer-historian Jeffrey Panos. These guys are very knowledgeable, but when I'm needed, I come in and I research for them, and I find the various details about the vehicles, their historical past, and any kind of nuances they want to know about. So I'm the, yeah, I'm the pet historian. And the historian has made an incredible find. Using this photograph, Jeff was able to match the serial numbers on this M18 Hellcat with the serial numbers on a Hellcat in Carl Smith's collection. And to top it off, Jeff has actually found the tank commander who drove this very same Hellcat. This tank was 60 years ago in Europe. It came back to the US, was rebuilt, was sent back to Bosnia, you know, came back to the US. We purchased it, came to Salt Lake, and there is a veteran here in Salt Lake that had a picture of this tank. There were 1,847 of these Hellcats made with the gun on it. And so it was one out of 1,847 Vegas odds that this could have been his Hellcat. And we believe it is, and we've been matching the serial numbers, and we think we've matched them. And almost too good to be true, the veteran is living down the highway in Salt Lake City. In a few days, Carl and his tank crew are going to reunite the commander with his Hellcat at a victory day party for veterans. This means Roger has got a big job on his hands. In the next few days, he's got to take this Hellcat and get it whipped into shape. Battle ready for a veteran who hasn't seen it in 60 years.
Our Hellcat here, basically all I've really done to it in the past was we sandblasted it and painted it to make it look good so it looked okay you know, while it was sitting in line. For our party that we're going to be putting on for the vets, we need to get it running, spruced up, cleaned up inside, painted. We have to go through the engine and get the turret pulled off, make sure everything operates and works. The M18 Hellcat was not born by chance. It was designed in the heat of battle to face off against a deadly enemy. Europe, 1940. Germany unleashed the most advanced mechanized force the world had ever seen. This was the Blitzkrieg. Brutal lightning strikes across Europe that overwhelmed everything in their path. The US Army needed something to knock out this rolling thunder. So they created the M18 Hellcat. Thanks to its light armor and lightweight radial aircraft engine, the M18 was faster than anything else on tracks. Factory production on the Hellcat started in 1943. It first saw action in the blazing summer of 1944. Crews loved the M18 for its speed. They also loved its smooth ride, thanks to a state-of-the-art suspension system. The newest track-laying vehicles, such as the 76mm gun-armored carriage, employs a new system known as torsion bar suspension. The upward movement of the arm twists the torsion bar, and its resistance acts like a spring in supporting the vehicle. Long after the Hellcat was designed, the U.S. Army's M1 Abrams still relies on a torsion bar system. The swing arms enable this 69-ton monster to travel smoothly at 45 miles per hour. But even all these years later, the Abrams is still not as fast as the M18 Hellcat. Able to cruise at about 53 miles an hour, the Hellcat's speed was legendary. And it had to be. In the final months of the war, four M18 Hellcats would play a pivotal role in one of the most important battles of the entire Second World War. Salt Lake City. It's got mountains, big sky, and wide open spaces. Plus, one of the world's largest private collections of military vehicles. Now we're up to over 180 pieces, and uh, I have a lifetime job sitting right here, you know, right in front of me. When you're rebuilding tanks, you've got to deal with serious battle scars. I do have another one outside that has come off another bombing range, and it's been napalm. I mean, you know, literally burned to a crisp. It's been burnt out, it's been torched, it's been everything you can imagine. I don't think even Roger can repair this. But right now, Roger's trying to get this M18 Hellcat ready for a big party honoring war veterans. At the party, one of the veterans is going to be reunited with this Hellcat. Hellcat he commanded in the Second World War. The party is only days away. When Roger first saw it, the Hellcat was a mess. They're open top, so they're rusted inside and full of twigs and branches and dust and dirt. So they were pretty dirty. Uh, a lot of times they didn't run. So I had a, a lot of stuff to start with. Some parts were completely gone. This is where Randy Killen comes in. I usually get a call. They say that they either have a part that's been rusted out or is actually missing. Uh, if it's rusted out, then we'll take it and try to get the dimensions from reference material books. Or if we have a duplicate part, we measure that up. We put it into a CAD system. A lot of the parts are flat pieces of metal because that was the easiest to work with. If you can 
get a flat piece and weld it to another piece or bolt it to another piece, then you're a lot faster than having to mold it. So a lot of our parts are recreated with flat sheets of steel. Easiest and fastest and most accurate way for us to do that is by using steel cutting laser. We usually make what we call a soft skin or a cardboard prototype, go back and fit it on the vehicle to make sure that our measurements are correct. We bring it back, do any final changes or adjustments, and then go have it made out of steel or whatever the appropriate material is. Hellcat was a ferocious fighter in the liberation of Europe. But the armored vehicle is not exactly what it seems. The M18 is, in fact, a tank destroyer. The Hellcat is not actually a tank. It's meant to engage other tanks. It's not really meant to engage infantry or support infantry. That's why it has no coaxial gun next to the barrel, nor one in the front hull. It's strictly to kill other tanks. American tank destroyers were designed to race ahead of an enemy attack. Then, they would lie in wait to ambush oncoming panzers. The M18 was supposed to strike first and then get out fast. A kind of shoot and scoot approach to battle. We were continuously using the Hellcat as a, a self-propelled gun. The armament on it with the 76 millimeter cannon was very effective, and the eyesight, the sight on it, was such that you could draw a bead on anything up to two, two and a half miles <laughs> distance. The M18 Hellcat was invented specifically to destroy tanks. But war transformed the Hellcat's role, and it was assigned to provide frontline support to the infantry. This Hellcat is one of the most beautiful vehicles that you could possibly imagine being in combat with. It was just a pleasure to drive them because they had such good traction and uh, speed. A very comfortable ride because it was riding like, like riding in a boat. A lot of times we were able to convoy uh, infantry on our tanks across the fields that way. The Hellcat's roll change was possible because it had the shooting power to make that switch. Let me tell you about the gun on the Hellcat. It's the same gun that went on the Sherman. It's a 7.6.2 millimeter flat trajectory cannon. The, the real difference was that the tank destroyer crews were issued this hot round, this anti-tank uh, armor-piercing round, and it made the difference to knock out enemy tanks. When these high-explosive anti-tank rounds slammed into enemy tanks, they would shoot a super-hot jet of molten steel right through the armor. The Germans responded by adding a sacrificial piece of plate armor on their hulls. This extra plate would diffuse the molten jet and protect the underlying armor and the crew. Modern armies have a different kind of tank destroyer. Here, German anti-tank crews use Milan rockets to take out targets over two miles away. These rockets operate on a similar idea to the Hellcat's high-explosive anti-tank rounds. But they pack a deadly extra punch. Each rocket is equipped with two warheads. The first warhead takes out the standoff armor. The second warhead penetrates the internal armor exploding into the crew compartment. 
these missiles are guided by wires, so their control signals can't be jammed by the enemy. A thin wire trails behind the rocket, allowing the operator to guide the missile directly to target. with armor-penetrating ammunition. The Hellcat was state-of-the-art in 1944. American designers thought its speed would give the Hellcat nine lives. And sometimes, it did. It was so maneuverable, and it had such less mass to push. Even its tracks are thinner. That's less inertia for the engine to overcome and spin those tracks again and again and again. Uh, it gave it such a tremendous speed, a remarkable speed. Don Breinholt was attached to the 603rd Tank Destroyer Battalion of the 6th Armored Division. On one mission in France, he was ordered to take out enemy positions. We cut off the road and got onto the field. I was the second destroyer at that time. Something prompted me to make a command. I said, Pip's given her a hard left, and he did. He gave her a hard left, and at that same time, I saw a muzzle flash of a German gun. I can still see the tracer, the smoke of the tracer as it went by, and I felt like I could reach out and touch that shell as it went by. It was that close. The maneuverability of the tank was immediately, you made a left-hand turn. It didn't take but just a second. But that gunner had a dead beat on us, I know. Hellcat saw heavy fighting all the way from France into Berlin. No wonder some of the survivors are so battered. But in the right hands, a piece of junk can become a piece of art. In battle, nothing was faster than the Hellcat. But that speed came at a tremendous price. To make the Hellcat as fast as possible, American engineers gave it a very thin hull. So thin, the heavy machine gun fire could cut right through it. Unlike the Hellcat, modern tanks combine speed and protection. The M1's armor is a top secret composite of steel and ceramics. Strengthened with depleted uranium, the M1's armor is almost indestructible. We had a tank in Iraq that took 50 RPG hits, and none of them penetrated. They pulled the tank back into the assembly area, and it had, you know, RPGs darted in there like a cushion. If I could travel back in time and I had already been on an Abrams, man, it'd be culture shock. Think about the survivability of a hit. Knowing in the back of your mind that if a German tank hit you, you were going up. You didn't feel the invincibility that you would have today. With the Hellcat, American tank designers sacrificed protection for speed. But that speed could mean the difference between life and death. In the middle of winter, up against a huge German offensive, the lightning-fast Hellcat would save the day and help win one of the biggest battles of the Second World War. Military Channel. Willa, Utah. In a few days, U.S. veterans will gather here to be honored by collector Carl Smith and his tank crew. Roger Condren has to get this M18 Hellcat ready for inspection by the same man who was its commander during World War II. No matter how difficult to track down a repair, the tiny details are critical to get a first-class restoration. I'll bead blast everything when I tape off the glass. I'll paint it and redo my numbers, uh, replace some of the gauges, and uh, it'll probably look real close to brand new when I'm done. The main difficulty in trying to restore all this stuff is getting a lot of the little detail items. The major components are fairly easily obtainable. You're uh, just about stuck with what you have. 
and luckily a lot of times stuff is really good. I get a lot of satisfaction because I can make this dash look just like brand new almost. And it's something that people really notice. The paint on the tank doesn't really matter. But when they look inside and see all these nice little red circuit breakers and see all the little arrows and, and what it's for, people are a lot more impressed by something that has contrast to it instead of just green. To get this Hellcat in driving condition, Roger Condren has to borrow the engine from the collection's other Hellcat. <laughs> Fixing up the Hellcat highlights a life-saving design feature. It's only 60 years old or so. You don't always win a war with the biggest gun or the toughest tank. Sometimes it's all about who gets back into action first. On the Hellcat, one of the nice features it did have was the ease of maintenance. It had a tailgate that dropped down in the back. So after about 20 minutes, you know, a couple guys, you could have the engine all undone and ready to pull out. You could change an oil pump, you know, oil lines, anything underneath that engine, you know, very quickly. So maintenance on a Hellcat was extremely easy. Okay, there we go. Rapid field repair gave the Allies an edge when they came face to face with superior German technology. Remember, you're never fixing a tank in a place like this. You're fixing it in the mud, you're fixing it in the snow, you're fixing it under fire. If you can create a tank that any farm boy or city kid can fix reliably and get it back into action, it's going to save his life and it's going to win you a war. There you go. Roger only has a few days to get the M18 ready for the party. Okay. Easy access to the engine That's makes it. a big difference. The M18's engine is designed to slide on tracks for easy access. Originally built for airplanes, the Hellcat's engine was air-cooled. The engines in the Hellcat are rather interesting. They are an aircraft radial. You don't have to mess with antifreeze and water and radiators getting shot out, you know, and leaking fluids. But when it came to crew comfort in wintertime, the M18's engine was no friend. Any winter battle in a Hellcat was like...